Jonathan Howson is Deputy Head of History and Politics at Pimlico Secondary School in central London. As well as teaching, he's starting his doctorate at the Institute of Education to research the ways in which children learn second-order historical concepts. There's a whole body of research evidence that's emerging that suggests that pupils bring certain preconceptions about their pictures of the past with them into the classroom. And what we need to do and aren't necessarily doing as teachers is identify what some of those preconceptions are. If we don't do that, we run the risk of simply piling on more skills and more history on top of misconceptions that they can go through their whole secondary school career without addressing. In this lesson, he'll concentrate on one of these second-order concepts, the nature of historical accounts. Analyzing a range of historical sources, pupils will test a generally accepted hypothesis about Kennedy's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis. They will then develop their own alternative hypotheses. Let's get the title up, Superpower Relations. Um, this is the sixth lesson we've done on this. What we're doing today is we're testing a hypothesis. What I find fantastic about working in a school like this is it's an extraordinarily rich and diverse environment. You have incredibly challenging behavior at one extreme, but at the other you have students are as gifted and capable as anywhere in the country. And as a result of that, within every class, we'll have an enormous range of abilities. And we'll also have a very varied understanding of the second order concepts, individual ones. This is our hypothesis. This is the main point of what we're doing today. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr. was a historian, and he maintained that Kennedy's response revealed, and this is the most important bit that I've got in quotes, a combination of toughness and restraint, of will, nerve, and wisdom, so brilliantly controlled, so matchlessly calibrated that it dazzled the world. Look at the adjectives. They're all positive. What could we do to look at completely the opposite? What would we do? Just reverse them and just see what somebody else might want to say about his actions. Okay, so on a spectrum, what's the opposite then of toughness? Weakness. Okay, and the opposite right. of wisdom. What would we say? Wise, unwise. I took the opportunity to concentrate on the Cuban Missile Crisis because it was such a pivotal point in history. And what I did was um, spent two double lessons looking at the substantive content of the Cuban Missile Crisis. In this lesson, I took the opportunity to go much deeper into the subject with a view to exploring a specific second order concept, which happened to be the nature of historical accounts. And this is just a health warning. This is not an exercise in simply finding extremes. Because you can have many instances, because this is nuanced, where some of his actions, some of the actions he's demonstrated, could be anywhere along this continuum. Knowing that I was going to be working on the nature of historical accounts, I spent quite a bit of time earlier on in the year trying to address at what level each one of these students is at. And that's been very useful in informing my teaching to know where individual students are with individual second order concepts. If it's dazzling, and that's the opposite of something's dazzling, Huh? Unimpressive. Yeah, very good. Or boring, even. Each one of these high-order concepts needs to be addressed individually. So you can overcome any misconceptions they have and have a, an accurate starting point to progress them onwards. This tape that I'm going to show you, which was broadcast at 10 o'clock in the morning, October 22nd, uh, by John F. Kennedy. And everybody in America and Canada sat down and watched it. My father actually remembers where he was, he remembers what he was wearing, what he was doing, and there's very, very few things in history that happen that way. The one that you'll all know in your generation is where were you during 9-11. What I was trying to do with that specific piece of film was to get the pupils to maybe understand at some level what it was like then to be sitting in your living room at 10 o'clock faced with the prospect of thermonuclear war. Including in particular the brave people of West Berlin will be met by whatever action is needed. The brave people of West Berlin. Finally, I want to say a few words to the captive people of Cuba. The captive people of to Cuba. To whom this speech is being directly carried. With all pupils, there'll be a range of feelings about certainly watching things like black and white television. Some will go, this is black and white television, it's boring, it's old, and don't see the point of it. But some will be looking at, as a, as looking at it as, a hist as an historical document. What do you think of what Kennedy did by addressing this crisis on television? Yes, Emily. I think, in some ways, it may have been rather stupid, that might have been a harsh word to use, but 
because people were scared because they were worried of what may come. But, but your general theme is, is this, the, the way it was going to alarm the population. Yeah, alarm. Okay, uh, Luke. Yeah, he, he sounded calm and talking about the bombs and stuff. He was yeah. very scared, by the way. Yeah, but, yeah. but as he talked about the bombs, he, there was kind of an undertone of like fear. And I thought he was just scaring America, basically. This is, this is part of his performance. I mean, his performance during the Cuban Missile Crisis, very much in the public, focused around what he would, in, in the public size, what he did on television. Joseph? He's just making it sound quite distant. Yeah. Like, it's not really gonna happen. Like, we've got the situation under control. Yeah. When I think that was actually far from the case. Very good. Very what good. was really interesting, they focused on the American public and what they were feeling about having viewed this film. Do the Americans need to be any more scared about communism than they already are? This has been going on for a while. It's really important that we make sure that we always come back to addressing the question. Because there are so many questions that we can ask, but we were asking one specific question. We weren't talking about political ideologies and partisanship and anything else. We were trying simply to assess Kennedy's performance during the Cuban Missile Crisis. But we're still skirting around the, 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 the core issue which I'm trying to get at. Tom. I think he's essentially just using all of this, uh, this technical fear language about where they can reach and what they can do just as a way for him to say what he has to say about Cuba and the lying Soviets. Wow. There's a subtle negotiation going on behind the scenes, all right? Robert Kennedy's talking to Debrinin. Um, there, there is an exchange of traffic that's going on back and forth, but he has done this publicly. Might not be aimed at the American people, Thank you. Well, who's it aimed at? The politicians that are involved, like Khrushchev and... Thank you. Now we're getting closer. He knew that um, Khrushchev was lying, but I don't think the rest of the world did kind of thing yet. So it was just infor informing them of what was going on behind the scenes here. Yeah. And, you, and um, in that bid that, to get the rest of the help to the rest of the world to help them in a way, to try to resolve this situation. But in politics, do you, need to, do you need to go on television to say that you're a liar? Um, he was trying to call his bluff and say, well, you're not going to do this. I'm the, I'm the stronger person here. I mm. know that you're not, in fact, going to destroy the whole of America with these nuclear weapons. So basically, now give up. You've been called a liar. There's no other way out of it. There is a tactic that he's employed, and you're dead right. That's exactly what he's done. There's if you call that. someone you bluff, no. If you call close, close. If you call someone's bluff, you're taking a chance on something. Risk. 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 Is this, is this not extraordinarily risky, when the when the fate of the world is at hand? It makes it Khrushchev's move. It, puts it certainly the ball does. In his court. It certainly does. It's 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 a real case of Khrushchev. It's your move or the end of the world. Let's place this somewhere on our spectrum. Now. Which ad adjectives do we want to use to employ? Yep. It'd be risky and quite unrestrained, but on the sa in the same time brave and uh, dazzling. Oh yeah. Do you, oh see, my God. do you see what's happening here? So what we, we've got, you're going to go dazzling for that. What else? Um, tough, uh, brave. Risky. Risky over here, yeah. After I'd gone through the whole exercise of modeling the speech and trying to come to an understanding that this was potentially both provocative and risky, once we arrived at that point, that would give them the framework to then look at the other sources in a critical fashion to try and work out, as we had in the spectrum, whether particular actions were risky or not, wise or foolish, etc., etc. This is actually Kennedy's notepad. This is a photograph of, of his paper taken at the time during the Cuban Missile Crisis. There is a... Um, look what he's got. He's written up here. Do you know how, what I mean by doodling, how, when you doodle? Yeah. Sometimes if you're thinking about something, you write it over and over again, or you draw the same shape. What's he written up here? Missiles. 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 Okay, and does that, does that what, is, what kind of impression does that leave you with? It means that's, what, that, that's, that's what's what in his mind, that it's occupied it. So does this demonstrate clear action plan or questions? Questions. Okay, all right, good. And that's the sort of thing you want to, that's the way you want to be thinking as you work through all this stuff here. Okay. What was interesting about the doodle page was that it's real archival evidence, so there was, it was interesting for them to actually see a photocopy of something that he'd written on. And then, in some way, to, to relate how they might doodle on a piece of paper to how the President of the United States is doodling on a paper. In other words, we're all human and we all have the same concerns. Aside from the politics, because it's very, very partisan politics, but what we're more interested in his performance, what he did 
during the crisis and whether he did it well. Did he act in a tough or weak way? Did he, was he restrained or unrestrained? Was he wise or unwise he in the way he handled it? He was very persistent. Oh yeah, he's, he was very persistent, yeah. And as we said, he was very, taking very risks. He was taking a lot of risks, especially with the speech on TV. Okay. We're writing an account of history, aren't we? We're writing a story about history. Yeah. Who are you using to help us understand how we see things? Sources. Sources, thank you, yeah. So you can, you're looking at the, you're using these sources, but a lot of these sources would have been available at the time. Why are we coming up with, why are we working with a slightly different view? See things differently over time. Yeah, you can, uh, over time, fantastic. So things, the, the, the view of things changes over time. What's My main aim is not to address everybody's differences, but to somehow try and get to them to the stage where they've moved beyond simply viewing um, an, an historical account as being a some picture of a perfect past. As long as they've come to that understanding, I think that's fantastic. You know, they've understood that the nature of historical accounts is to be different. About a year ago, or at the beginning of this year, some of them would have had much lower level ideas of what the nature of historical accounts is, if they'd even considered it. In his mind, yeah, he, he didn't know what, what to do in his mind, yeah. So, that's why, that's why I reckon why he came and told the public everything. Because, okay. he, because he thought that doing that would just cut things short. Because he cut down um, Khrushchev's choices and he knew he wasn't he um, wasn't gonna bomb America. And the reason why he told the public about that was, I reckon, because he didn't have no plans in his mind okay, of what to do to stop it personally. Tom, Kennedy, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, acted out of a desire to seem strong, to lionize capitalism and demonize communism. Kennedy was, I believe, genuinely fearful of world destruction and so acted, although risky, in knowledge of the completely destructive threat of these missiles. What was interesting about the statements at the end of it was that they concentrated on the politics, they concentrated on the ideologies, um, which isn't surprising because it's at this stage that they're really grappling with the, the nature of um, difference in politics with different political ideologies and they're at this age really starting to get into it. That's okay because in the end they have come up with a different account for the same set of historical events. Uh, Kennedy's actions were uh, clever and um and well thought out because they left the decision of what to do and the consequences of it on Khrushchev's plate um, over the Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay, girls? Although on the surface of Kennedy's response to the Cuban Missile Crisis... This course is an exam course, and one of the most important jobs that we have to in history is to try and encourage the students to write well, and to write well, um, to write discursive essays. So what I'm going to do is give the students a statement. That statement will be something like, did Kennedy perform brilliantly during the Cuban Missile Crisis? Discuss. Now, between the three elements, the substantive content in the first section, an exploration of the second order concept, the nature of historical accounts, and this discursive essay writing, there has been a very concise, in-depth study of their, uh, of their history and preparation for their exams. Kennedy knew he had to take risk in order to not look weak to Khrushchev. He showed nerve in these actions he took, but his personal vendetta with Khrushchev left to, led to actions that would not be diplomatically wise. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, you've all done very well. Thank you very much. Um, Three weeks ago, these students knew nothing about the Cuban Missile Crisis. They knew absolutely none of the substantive history. And we're now at the stage where they've gone from working through where the general public would be, um, that. Kennedy was fantastic in his handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis to actually reflecting more critically on his performance. And I think that's an enormous movement. And we've done that through by addressing in some detail the substantive history and actually addressing the higher order concept of the nature of historical accounts by testing a hypothesis.